This is Brand USA Talks Travel, elevating the conversation about international travel to the United States. Here's your host, Mark Lapidus. Do Ted Lasso fans ever ask you if Trent Krem works at the Independent? Let me pass you over to Trent. He's just over here. Hold on one second. <laughs> and um, oh, nope, sorry, he was fictional. Yeah, no, we are very aware of our most famous fictional creation, and we've had many a laugh over that as well. Jordy Grieg is a British journalist, the editor-in-chief of The Independent since January 2023, and the former editor of England's Daily Mail. Welcome to Brand USA Talks Travel, Jordy. It's a pleasure to be with you. It really is. You obviously know America well, having lived in New York for a long time, as you just said, covering the United States, and also traveling here extensively. Since you understand both British and American cultures, what is it that people in the UK find most attractive about visiting the USA? I'm married to an American. I'm married to a Texan. So every day she suddenly insinuates, I must remember that Texas itself is five and a half times the size of England. So I cave to that greater knowledge. And actually what's amazing about America is its scale, its sense of opportunity. I mean, Oscar Wilde said, it's not a country, but a world. And he was right. And there's a sense of opportunity and excitement and can do, which I love about it. And it's one of my favorite places always to come back to. Every time there's an opportunity to jump on a plane, to come back to the USA, I'm there. Do you recall how many states you visited and what are a few of your favorites? I guess it must be over 25 states. I have a particular love of California. Being in a car, going up that Pacific Coast Highway, blue sky, blue sea, open road. I live most of the time in New York City, which I think is one of the great iconic capitals of anywhere. But then there were opportunities to go and see the blue bonnets of Texas at Easter, which were like a blue oasis of color and glory of nature. So I'm, you know, torn up for choice. Since you've seen so much of America, what do you think makes a good travel story about the United States, especially now in 2023? America is incredible value for money. It's variety. There's bars, beaches, barbecues, incredible houses. There's history. There's open country. There's mountains. There's almost everything you would ever want in a holiday. But somehow it seems bigger, better, extraordinarily beautiful and enticing. And I think it's the value for money you get coming to America in terms of there is no disappointment. It's an amazing journey where your curiosity can meet amazing opportunities. Since you brought up value, I've been wondering about this. For more than 20 years, the pound was stronger than the dollar. Is the current strength of the U.S. dollar affecting the decisions of British travelers, or is the desire to see the USA so strong that it's not really a determining factor? I think value over price is always the overriding factor when people think of where they're going to go and whether they're going to be skiing in Colorado or surfing in California, or hitting those exotic, amazing beaches in Hawaii. Once you're there, if it's a little bit more expensive, I think it's like going to a restaurant where you think, oh, it's a little bit expensive. If it's super delicious, you think, I'm so glad I came. And I can't think of anyone I know who's recently come back, or at any time come back from a holiday in America, and doesn't say, it was bigger, better, more beautiful, more bountiful than I thought it was going to be and I'm going to go back. The world has certainly turned to a much smaller place, so let's talk about the time it takes to get back and forth from the UK to the United States and how you view it these days. It's surprisingly easy. I mean, I find flying to America because either it's a longer flight to the West Coast, which I rather enjoy, with the time lapse, you've almost gained time. It doesn't feel like a a lost time. And if you're going to the East Coast, you can literally leave at breakfast and you arrive in time for lunch. What could be nicer? What could be easier? You've edited several of the most prestigious papers in the UK, from the Evening Standard to the Daily Mail. How has your job changed over the years? The most dramatic change has been technology. I began when we were printed in hot metal. I remember the miracle of the fax machine coming into our office all those years ago. And now, you know, I run the biggest quality digital news brand in the UK. The speed of coverage, we can get a story up within seconds. We can get the reach of that story being beyond the imagination. When I started in a local newspaper in London, 12 billion people look at our website each year. And that is an astonishing reach. And there's a magic to the scale. And there's an excitement about the speed. And there's a liberalization 
of the diversity which you can do within that. The different news, features, we're very, very keen on green politics. We're very, very keen on shining lights in places where we can investigate so that there is great colour, great reports, great views and great excitement. And that's what a publication should be. I was really blown away about that viewing statistic. I noticed it on your Twitter feed this past week. It makes The Independent the eighth largest digital news brand in the United States, bigger than many U.S.-based publications. To what do you attribute the success? Well, we're very proud of those statistics. I've got a brilliant team who digitally, I think, are completely world-class in getting our message across. But then it comes back to the name of The Independent, and it's on the tin. I think people want trusted news brands, and that sense of authority and trust we take very, very seriously. And I think people respect that and reciprocate that and block into us, listen to us when we do audio, watch us when we do independent TV, and read us when we are The Independent. Jordy, what's your vision for The Independent, and how can U.S. destinations work with your publication? Our ambition is very large to keep expanding, to keep growing, to have a global presence. But, you know, with that DNA starting 35 years ago when The Independent was formed. And I think that travel is going to be a very, very important silo in what we do. We're about information. We're about creating idols. We're about the dreams of travel, about the adventure. But also, how, where, what do I spend? Where's the best place to go? We're very informational, as well as having those reads where you think, I just wish I was there. As you were just saying, what were once newspapers are now truly media organizations with a heavy use of video and audio. Can you describe how that's affected your travel coverage? We're very proud of the expansion and the quality of our video and independent TV. And when we can show people riding away, or even riding a bronco, or being in a national park, or going up a mountain. If you get that sense of being plunged into their world, that moving world where you can hear, see, it makes you, all of us, think, I wish I was on a plane. I wish I was getting out and feeling that warm air or even that chill of the mountain air, but that thrill of being on the road. I'm curious about the way that The Independent captures video and audio in the United States. Do you mainly use freelancers, have your own staff members who work here, or maybe use materials supplied by destinations like B-Roll? How do you go about collecting it? Well, we have a number of bureaus, but we also, like all news publications, we use valued freelancers. Often they're expert in the place where they're covering. But it's... America may be large, but it's actually can all be accessed from a very small thing called a phone where you can book, you can see, you can make your dreams come true. And I think travel is a sort of dream factory element about it. If you're brought into feeling, you can almost sense the heat of being in Hawaii, that warm waft of air. And if you feel someone's movement, you hear the rush of the wave or you hear the sizzle of a lobster, all those things bring it more immediately to life. And video is very, very important, a huge growth area for us. As we embrace people in America into our organization, as well as we have British journalists there who try and look objectively at the extraordinary opportunity that those hundreds of millions of acres in America, those extraordinary coastlines, those mountains, the Appalachians, the Adirondacks, there are so many places which have a part of, of the history and the lure of adventure and making us open our eyes to new opportunities and new places. Jordy, you're describing this so well, you should narrate audiobooks. <laughs> you're very kind, Mark. I've written a couple of books, but I think I'm going to stick to news. One of the things that you and I both grew up with was everything being shot on film and then later videotaped. So if a camera wasn't there, it was almost as if the news event didn't even occur. Today, with everyone having a recording device in their pocket, we all benefit from the ease of content creation and seeing things often, even in real time. The opportunities which have arisen out of really the mobile phone, which links into social media, which links into people. We've all been in restaurants or beaches where people have got their phones and they're taking pictures, they're looking at pictures, they're swapping pictures. The movement of information, and particularly images, has absolutely transformed our way of relating to places and people. And that, in travel, is fundamental. 
as we see people taking selfies in front of great monuments or if they're in a park with a grizzly bear behind them or a soaring eagle up in the sky when they promise you that dot in the picture is the eagle or they zoom in and you see the eagle. (laughs) Everyone is, in a way, a videographer, a cameraman, a documentary maker. The films of our lives we control with the touch of our fingers. Do you utilize user-generated content in the independent? Do you know what? Journalism used to be only the people who are on a paper, on a TV station, with a radio station, having access to information which they can then push out to the world. Today, we're all journalists. We have sometimes people sending us videos. We can pick up stuff from Twitter. People have Instagram accounts, which sometimes they share with us. And those can be used by us in different ways, different platforms we have. So we're an open door. We create and we take. We use and we never let people lose the opportunity to see what we think is going to capture the imagination and capture the spirit and be part of a learning process of what we hear, see and learn. I am 100% certain that one of the items you're deeply discussing internally at The Independent is artificial intelligence. Everybody's talking about it. Tell me how you think AI may play into future coverage. Well, it's a credible new future aspect. This ability for us to tell our phone, our computer, to come up with a processed composition of words which competes with an essay, with an analysis, with a report. Are we going to be going into a place where this brave new world becomes a terrifying new world? Or is it going to be how brilliantly efficient we can make things happen quicker and we can stop some of the drudge of creating information by allowing the imagination to be alongside that? Or will it have its own imagination and outplay us? We watch and we listen and we will learn, but it's going to be... I think one of the most dramatic new technological experiments which will become part of our lives. And it already is. We see students, you know, being told not to write their essays with ChatGPT. And if that is the way in which people think they can process information, it's going to, in some ways, lessen the ability and the enthusiasm of learning. But I always think originality, creation and imagination are things which machines can never fully outplay human being. We started to use AI in this podcast, too, with at least one question a week from ChatGPT. Here's one that the AI gave me for you. What advice would you give to aspiring journalists or editors who are just starting out in their careers? Are there any particular skills or experiences that you think are essential for success in this field? My answer to that would be let your curiosity run fast and hard and high. Allow your sense of morality to try and do what you think is best for others. Have an honesty which you hold yourself up to with standards of accuracy and decency. Those are all things which may be able to play into a chat GBT, but hopefully the human values, decency, accuracy, transparency, and trying to further the journey of inquiry are what will override even the bestest machines. It's all about curiosity, isn't it? There was a famous journalist called Auburn Waugh, who was the son of Evelyn Waugh, the great novelist. And he once said to me, the point of journalism, it's like dropping a penny down a well. If you can't hear that penny hit the water and echo back, you're writing into a void. And we all want to know that our message is reached and there's a reaction and that there's a consequence. And curiosity is a key component of travel. The main thing that drives me, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners to travel, is learning and seeing new things. I think that's absolutely right. I mean, you know, one of the places which I haven't visited and I love to go will be Yellowstone Park. I'd love to see that landscape of Wyoming and Montana and, you know, and a bit, bit of Idaho. Those geysers, those fields, those mountains, that stretch of arid but incredible landscape. I remember going to the Grand Canyon for the first time and thinking that spatial exploration, which it seems to ask you to venture into, is beyond any experience of seeing it on film or reading a description of it. And that's what travel journalism is about. It's trying to set a temptation that when you get the person to grab that chance, that the reality is even more exciting and replenishes our knowledge and our soul and our whole joy of being on this planet. 
Before we go, Jordy, I just got to ask you, over your many years in journalism, who have been some of your favorite interviews? I've been so lucky, Mark. I've had some amazing people who I've been able to ask questions to, including Madonna. In the world of literature, Tom Wolfe, your man in the white suit. But I've also been able to interview British prime ministers from John Major to Gordon Brown to David Cameron. So I've had some pretty lucky opportunities and I feel very privileged to have done that. And I've gone from being a crime reporter in my first early days where I was interviewing gang leaders. And then when I was in New York for the London Sunday Times... I even covered the Gotti Mafia trial and still have my Gotti card as an entry into that courtroom all those years ago. It's been such a pleasure speaking with you, Jordy. You make me want to go on holiday in my own country. (laughs) (laughs) Count me in. Let me know when you're going, Mark. Thanks so much for taking the time. And that's Brand USA Talks Travel. I'm Mark Lapidus. Thanks for listening. Your feedback is welcome. Email us at podcast at thebrandusa.com or call 202-793-6256. Brand USA Talks Travel is produced by Asher Mirovich, who also composes music and sound. Engineering by Brian Watkins. Please share this podcast with your friends in the travel industry. You may also enjoy many of our archived episodes, which you can find on your favorite podcast platform. Safe travels.